Good morning, Michael. Thank you very much um, for joining us today and for your time. The idea behind these conversations is um, very simple, which is that a significant uh, amount of problems have come to the fore as a result of this pandemic. We have identified not only the negative consequences in terms of the health issues, but also the social and political and economic consequences of the different kinds of policies that governments and societies have implemented. But more than that, I think one of the most significant things that has uh, become apparent to people is the underlying vulnerabilities of individuals and populations that become revealed as a result of this kind of shock and threat. And you have, uh, more than anyone, identified how long-standing inequalities, if that's the right word, in social inequalities, um, make people vulnerable to ill health, but also you know, epidemic infections, but also just poor life, quality of life. But we know the problem, and I think we've done a lot of sort of recognizing the problems. And what we wanted to do in these conversations is to talk about some of the potential solutions um, and also to identify people who are good at solutions and to have and to talk with them about what are the, the things that you see in the world as the solutions that need to be identified and amplified. And so we are using the kind of trope of the advent calendar, which is sort of the 12 days to Christmas, but this is the 12 days or more to the UHC day, and trying to find that kind of inspirational uh, ideas, uh, actions and activities that could inspire people to keep going and to sort of build a better world. And I couldn't have thought of a better person than you to sort of go beyond the problem to the solution. So I just wanted to have a conversation with you. And so, so I guess just to start off and to warm up the conversation, um, I guess I want to ask you, how are you? I haven't talked to you, you know, I think, you know, for months. How are you doing? And is it, are you still running at breakneck speed? Or is it, have things changed? Or is there a way that you would describe the the ethos, uh, the tempo of the last year? Well, there's a good side, uh, which is that the likelihood of achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 has gone up because I've stopped catching aeroplanes. Um, so I've contributed to progress in global warming. I think I'm known as a particular hotspot for greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a good side. But um, the other side of that is the reason I travel around so much is because there's real global interest in social determinants of health and health equity. And we're involved in networks in Asia, in Europe, now in North Africa and the Middle East, um, in Latin America, I mean, really all over. Uh, we were just setting up links in India um, I was talking to Sri Lanka this morning, and it's much harder to do that from my desk in North London. On the other hand, because I'm not traveling to those places this morning, uh, the first thing, 7.30, I was talking to an indigenous health group in Queensland, in Australia. Then I did a lecture in Sri Lanka. Now I'm doing an interview with you. You're not in Geneva, but you're in London. Um, I'm doing a thing in Washington, D.C. Uh, later today. So uh, there's no way that I could have done all that in a day in the past. I would have had to fly to Sri Lanka, spend two days and, or three days or whatever it is. Um, and then I couldn't have done the other thing or flown to Australia. So uh, in an odd way, I'm doing much more um, and it, a lot of it is global, all from my desk in North London, but it's of a different character. And what it's teaching us is when we need to be there in person and when we don't. Um, and that's important. And then, of course, which I guess is the topic of our conversation, um, the pandemic has made what 
I'm concerned with, more important, squared. Um, I mean, it's, it's just heightened the importance of social determinants of health and health equity. Yeah, I mean, so I would, you know, I would, I would, I strongly agree with you. Um, squared, I don't know if is the, I think you, there's a higher power involved, not just okay. squared, but because I think that not only, uh, I think we could spend a lot of time talking about all the things that have gone wrong uh, and all the things that I'm worried about. Um, but one of the main ideas behind this conversation is to identify uh, points or activities that you think are the way forward that are that are on track. What would you you know what would you identify as sort of things that should give us hope, inspiration, and that we should be rallying behind and supporting? Well, um, I do look at the negative in a positive way, in a way, you know, so I don't dwell on the negative, but I look at the negative as a way of what can we learn to do things better. So next week, in six days time, um, on the 15th of December, we're going to publish um, Build Back Fairer, the COVID-19 Marmot Review. And the, the, if I can, the history of this. So, you know, and as I've already said, I'm very much involved in global health activities, but I'm also involved nationally and domestically in what's going on in my own country. And after the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, uh, I was asked by the British government to produce a report on health inequalities, as we call it in Britain, um, in England, how could we apply the recommendations and findings of the WHO Commission um, to one country, England? And the Marmot Review was published in 2010, and then the government changed. So the government, the commission, me was a Labour government, then we had a Conservative-led coalition government. And we look back at the last 10 years, and in February 2020, we published Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review, 10 years on. What had happened in the last 10 years? And my simple summary was we lost a decade. The slowdown in life expectancy improvement was more marked in the UK than in any other European country. In fact, than in any other big country, um, Europe or big, Iceland's not very big, it's European, it was slower, and the United States was slower. But otherwise, the slowdown in the UK was more marked than in every other rich country. And health inequalities were increasing, and life expectancy was going down for the poorest people outside London. Very poor picture. And then the pandemic crashed on us, and we had the highest excess mortality in Europe. In fact, Everybody's agreed that the US handled the pandemic particularly badly. The excess mortality in the UK was higher than in the United States. So I was then thinking, what's the link between what happened in the decade after 2010 and our poor health status in 2020 and our poor handling of the pandemic? And you're asking me for positives, but I think these four lessons that I think I've learned are related to the future. And um, this is what we're gonna publish in our report next week. The first is the quality of governance and the political culture. If government, um, the government in 2010 had as a priority, what they stood for was austerity financial rectitude. It wasn't improving the health and well-being of the population. It was reducing the debt to GDP burden. Well, okay, but that doesn't seem to be a very important social goal. It may be a means to some kind of end, but wow, that's not a very inspiring goal. The second was we had growth of inequalities of wealth and income and social conditions. Not so good. The third was the government disinvested from public services. So we limped into the pandemic with poor quality public services that were lacking in funding. And the fourth was we weren't very healthy. 
we had quite a lot of illness, which puts people at high risk of COVID-19 mortality. Now that's all negative, but I'm calling my report next week, Build Back Fairer. What do we do to build back fairer? Well, I think we need to address those four things that I just mentioned. And we will give the evidence on what you can do on early child development, on education, on employment and working conditions, on distribution of income, on communities, neighborhoods and environment, and on health behaviors, all of which uh, are unequally distributed and all of which contribute to inequities in health. And we've got good examples from different places of how you can make a difference on those things from the UK, from Europe, from Costa Rica, from elsewhere. So, you know, so this is one of the valuable things about your analysis usually is that you find you give us very often a very clear chain of causation to why things have gone wrong, but you also produce very clear recommendations on, you know, what is it that needs to happen. And so here you've sort of said very clearly this stuff. So I want to push you a bit further here is that these tend to be all levers for policymakers. These tend to be sort of programmatic policy stuff. I mean, is that the, is that the way to work on social determinants of health? So you said the number one policy is governance, right? So governance, so how do you get governance to be better? Is there a match between the governance problem and the, and the kind of policy levers that you are, you are recommending? Well, it's not the only way. So that's the first thing to say. I mentioned that I had a conversation with uh, indigenous health people in Queensland, in Australia this morning. And uh, so if you think Queensland is one of the more northern states and one of the indigenous health leaders, they have something that they call community controlled healthcare organizations. And he works north of Cairns. So that's in the tropics, you know, it's really northern Australia in a remote community north of Cairns. And he was explaining, so his mission is a health care organization. But he, he was explaining to me that uh, young youngsters of the male persuasion, um, you know, young men getting into trouble um, with stealing cars and up to, you know, it's not serious mischief, but it's mischief. I mean, it's not organized crime, but it's getting, you know, we know about all this, so getting into trouble. And here's this, healthcare man and he said well what we're trying to do is we've got to at the one hand really work on cultural continuity really give them uh, a sense of where they came from and their continuity with the elders and their tradition and at the same time we've got to make sure that they get an education, they get a job. We've encouraged some of them to go into the military, into the armed services, because it's a job and, you know, they get training. And um, so we've got, and here's this, and he said, I was doing all this. Then I came across one of your reports and realized I was doing what you were recommending <laughs> and but doing it at the community level. And so the two people I spoke to this morning, one was from the state government she works, you know, she's Deputy Director General of Health. And the other was leading a community controlled organization, although notionally health care, recognized the importance of if you want young men to stay out of mischief, you've got to give them a meaning in life and dignity and economic and employment opportunities. Um, you can't just make sure they turn up to the health care. Um, yeah organization. So you need it at both levels. The question then is, how do you get the people at the government level? And I don't know. I don't know. I know what I do. But I can't tell you, I haven't got a good analysis of when they listen and when they don't listen. Um, what I can say is that when, for example, in democratic countries, um, the standard argument 
that I hear usually from the civil servants, not from the politicians, but usually from the civil servants, they say, our ministers can only see up to the next election. They can't see beyond the next election. And my response to that is, yeah, okay, I understand that. But is that why they're in office to get reelected? They have no higher purpose than getting reelected. What about if their purpose was to improve health and well-being of the population? Maybe they could see beyond the next election. Maybe they could inspire people with their vision. I mean, if you're telling me your political masters have one purpose, which is to get reelected, well, I guess I've got no basis for conversation with them. But if they have some other reason for being there, and most of them would admit to that, having some other reason for being there, then we can work together. Then we yeah. can take a longer view. Yeah, I mean, so, but this is actually where I think, you know, no amount of, ep there's enormous epidemiological studies and you're going to produce another, you know, a fantastic and important report. But one of the things that I have learned over the last few months is that there's a big gap between evidence and then action. And one of the things that I've learned, and, and I think you probably said it, in one of your longstanding fight has been this kind of a contrast between the economy and health. And, and this has been one of your longstanding issues, this idea of the trade-off between economy and health. And it's, again, back on the back on the map as being the, you know, the one sort of conflict that we all have to choose on either side. But, you know, it's amazing that how many politicians and policymakers will take so many risks for the sake of economic growth or take so many different kinds of advice or follow some new and novel plan for economic growth. But when it comes to health, we don't have that same kind of commitment and that same kind of willingness to listen widely, to take the risks, to uh, stuff. And so I'm wondering, how do you make that? How do you get the politicians? Where have you seen the politicians switch from, you know, or recognizing the value of health and move away from the idea that this is about health care and move to this commitment to health? Have you seen any examples over the last? Um, Yes, you notice I'm slightly tentative in my yes. Um, what I try to do is to make the case based on evidence. And as you said in your introduction to this question, we know the evidence only takes you so far. Um, but so take the trade off between health and economics. The evidence is pretty clear. If you control the COVID-19 pandemic well, you get less of an economic hit. It's not either shut down the economy um, and the, what did Trump say, the cure will be worse than the disease or something. Uh, it's garbage. It's absolute pure unadulterated garbage. Control the pandemic. Taiwan controlled the pandemic. Hong Kong controlled the pandemic. Japan controlled the pandemic. South Korea, China. Um, the, let's look to the East. Let's look to the countries that control the pandemic well. They had a very small economic hit. Um, the countries that did badly, the UK, Mexico, um, other European countries, France, um, did badly. Australia and New Zealand that controlled the pandemic well had less of an economic hit. So it was the wrong trade-off. Take the right steps. Um, what did the Prime Minister of New Zealand say? Go hard, go early. She was decisive. She communicated well with the population. And we in the UK were not decisive. We did it, communicated very badly. We have a prime minister who com communicates in metaphors and figures of speech and people say, what did he say? What, what was that about? You know, Angela Merkel in Germany communicated well. She's a scientist. Um, she was very matter of fact. She communicated well. So this is, I'm not sort of, pushing one political party or another, I'm pushing good governance. Um, and good governance means no trade-off between the economy and good health. Now, what happens as we build back fairer? Well, here I'm dependent on economists because everything I'm recommending will cost money. 
um, in the UK, we cut, we cut children's centers, we cut spending per pupil, we cut local authorities, the health service spending didn't rise in line with NHS inflation. We, so putting that right, we'll take money. And the standard response is, oh my God, we're in trouble. How can we spend money? We've got a huge debt because of the COVID-19 crisis. Well, my understanding is that's completely fallacious reasoning. The whole idea that the nation has maxed out on its credit card is economically illiterate. That a country, particularly like the UK, which controls its own currency, economists say that interest rates will be zero or negative or close to zero for the foreseeable future. The government can borrow money. We're also a very low tax country. It can raise more money in taxation. So it can spend to make a better society. And it must, it should, and it can. So we need to get that clear. What's the priority? Getting the debt to GDP ratio down or creating a better society? And I think that's not a naive opposition. Uh, I think that's real. And the, the other thing, I mean, just looking at the US, um, you know, people are saying that the team of President-elect Biden has shocking familiarity. They've all been around, you know, politics. This is reestablishing the old status quo. Well, that looks pretty desirable at the moment. Just having competence um, would be quite good. But then... Um, the US state of health pre-Trump was pretty poor. Life expectancy was declining pre-Trump. Trump didn't cause those problems. Trump was in a sense a result of those problems. People for whose lives, for, for whom lives were getting worse, voted for Trump. And there was an expression of pain, uh, which he exploited. Um, so the new administration has got to deal with that social and economic pain. Um, they can't ignore and say, well, they were just Trump voters. Uh, no, they were people who were suffering. And um, a snake oil salesman appealed to them um, successfully, but um, their pain but, has got to be addressed. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, as you know, I mean, this is, I think, a really interesting point. So as you know, I'm an American um, and one of the things that I think speaks directly to what uh, you know, you've been talking about for the last two decades is what happened in Georgia in the United States during the election. So, you know, health in terms of just sheer survival was on the table for a lot of people. And that is what motivated political organizing, grassroots organizing and action. And so, you know, a lot of people miss this point is that they think, oh, this was just about an election. This is about getting somebody elected. But I think what that was about was about survival and saying we now want uh, to fight back and we want to live and to live long and our children to be safe and healthy. And we are going to engage in the political process and we're not going away. Uh, and so I think that is one of the positive uh, highlights for me from the nightmare that has been the United States for the last three years. And I'm I sort of, I, you know, I think that it's, it's not told very much as a health story. It's told very much as an election uh, and sort of how, you know, sort of this was, I think it's, a, I think, you know, health is very much at stake in that, in that kind of action. Well, and... and See, the argument, as you know well, Sridhar, because you've heard me say it for a long time, and when I feel I need an imprimatur for this argument, I quote Amartya Sen, um, but the argument that health is a measure of how well the society is meeting the needs of its members. Um, as I say, I quote Amartya Sen, but uh, many of us have been thinking about that for a long time. So coming back to the US, uh, there was a researcher at Penn State who looked at deaths of despair uh, from drugs 
alcohol and suicide in the US. And there was a correlation geographically between mortality from deaths of despair and voting for Trump. Trump's increase in the vote over Romney 2016 versus 2012 correlated highly geographically with mortality from drugs, alcohol, and suicide. And that's what I mean by health. You know, so I'm agreeing with you when what you're talking about with Atlanta, that health is an expression of how well the society was doing. I mean, you can't get any more naked expression than suicide, drugs, alcohol, people killing themselves. Uh, life has so got awful that they're killing themselves um, either directly or with these drugs and alcohol, and then voting for Trump. Um, now you're saying in Atlanta, um, people voted for Biden, um, they neck and neck with the Senate races. Um, so it's vital in every country that we recognize that health is telling us something about how well people's lives are progressing. And the government has a clear role to play in improving those conditions. And to come back to something we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, so do the communities, um, the, the strength of communities. And one of the strengths in the United States is the strength of communities. Uh, Robert Putnam has written about the decline in that strength, but that is a strength. And there's a lot of interest in action at city level and at community level in the US. And when we look around globally, where governments can't act or won't act on equity and social determinants of health, the action can take place el elsewhere. So you, you asked me, where do I see positive signs? And in India, for example, um, the Self-Employed Women's Association is just a continued inspiration to me and many other people. Um, when they had a friendly government in Delhi, they were acting. And when they had an unfriendly government in Delhi, they were acting and improving the lives of their members uh, who are the poorest, most marginal women in India. And you hear these stories that are so moving. Um, of you know the granddaughter of one of the saver members going off to university. This is a woman who made a few rupees a day um, selling vegetables or cleaning streets or whatever, and it wasn't her daughter, but it was her granddaughter then goes to university. So it's changing people's lives and they can be changed by national government, by local government, by third sector, civil society organizations, community organization. And we've got good examples from around the world of that happening. Yeah, no, I think that that's absolutely right. So there is no, there doesn't, I mean, thankfully, I think there isn't one formula. There's actually multiple actors that seem to be able to move, uh, you know, this sort of agenda forward. Um, so I think that's one of the great hopes that I have is that actually it, it's not all reliant on one actor or one group of people. There's no stuff. But also I think that, um, you know, sort of work like yours has been really great in clarifying the pathways because I think people used to not know how to connect these things. And so, you know, sort of your work has been uh, really important. So I look forward to this report um, on on Friday. I've been sort of uh, waiting for it. Tuesday next week, on the 15th, you said? Yeah. 15th. That's good. Um, but so again, thank you very much for your time. As always, I could talk to you for hours about lots of different things, but I really appreciated um, your, your sort of chance to share with us what you've been doing and also to highlight uh, sort of uh, what, what actually is working and what could be uh, way forward. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.